Open your Bibles up tonight, once again, as we continue our study through the book of Philippians, chapter 2, uh, verses 5 to 11 is where we're going to be at uh, tonight, and I'm calling tonight's message, uh, Knowing the Real Jesus. We live in a day where we really need to know who the real Jesus is, right? There, there's all types of counterfeit Jesuses out there. Uh, there. There's nothing new about this. There's always been false prophets. There's always been uh, false messiahs that have been trying to uh, infiltrate the church. Uh, we know this because that's what the devil does. The devil is a liar and the devil is a deceiver. That he is uh, the master of confusion. And so why is it so important that we know the real Jesus? Mainly because we can't experience real salvation without knowing the real Jesus. You place your faith in the wrong Jesus, you wind up in hell for all of eternity. Right? We can't place our faith in the wrong Jesus and expect to end up in the right place. It doesn't work like this. You see, we don't get to create and customize our own Jesus. You have conversations with people at times and they'd say, well, my Jesus would never fill in the blank. You know, my Jesus isn't like that. The, 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 my Jesus doesn't get mad about this. My Jesus is okay with this type of lifestyle. My Jesus, y'all know what I'm talking about? Have y'all had those conversations? And I said, well, you, your, your Jesus isn't the Jesus of the Bible because your Jesus is contradicting what the Word of God says. And so this is the Jesus that we must know. That we don't get to uh, have a personalized Build-A-Bear type of Jesus. That we can make, the, make Him be any type of Savior that we want. We either believe in the Jesus of Scripture or we are believing in the wrong Jesus. And if we place our faith in a counterfeit Jesus, then the only logical conclusion is that our reconciliation with God God will also be counterfeit. And we'll live out our days with unregenerate hearts, trying to be good people and still wind up in hell when we die. Jesus warned about this. This has always been an issue in the church and for people seeking after God. We see this in uh, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And listen to verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I believe this is one of the most frightening passages in the Bible. This makes it perfectly clear that it's possible to spend your whole life in church and still wind up in hell. Doing all the right things, doing all the things you think that you should be doing, but never placing your faith in Christ. Just being a religious person, a a church attender, Someone that never commits themselves fully to Christ. They're not born again. They're just good old-fashioned, self-righteous people. You see, the Jesus that we believe in must be the same Jesus that Paul was writing about in our passage tonight. It's believed that these verses served as a, as a hymn that was sung by the early church or, or maybe a, a creedal statement that was recited when the early church gathered together. That Paul knew that the most important thing that he could do for anyone, especially for those that are in the church, was to make sure that they fully understood who the real Jesus was. And so for us to be sure that we know the real Jesus, we must understand the same three things that Paul was emphasizing in our passage tonight. We must understand the divinity of Jesus, the humility of Jesus, and the sovereignty of Jesus. That's our, our three points that we look at uh, look at tonight. So grab your Bibles and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word together. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Paul writes, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, 
of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, we do thank You for this day that You've given us. We thank You for Your Word. Uh, we thank You for this passage that we're studying tonight. Father, I pray that You would help us to, to, to understand the biblical Jesus, that the Jesus in whom we have believed, and Father, if there's deviations or, or there are variations in our minds or our hearts in regard to this Jesus, let us reconcile them tonight. And Father, I pray for those that are here tonight that don't yet know this Jesus, that maybe before they leave tonight, they will know this Jesus. Father, thank you for this day. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So to know the real Jesus is why we're gathered here tonight and look at this passage. The first thing we must do is understand the divinity of Jesus, the, the godness of Jesus. We see this in 5 and 6. It says, Let this mind be in you, which it was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. When we share the gospel with someone, uh, as Baptists, we invite, you know, we're asking them or telling them to, or offering them, however you want to state it, to invite, uh, 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 we invite people to ask Jesus to come into their hearts to be saved, right? That's some of the terminology that we use in the church. But what we're seeing here also is that we need to be invited, uh, inviting them to ask Jesus to come into their minds also, right? Not just their hearts, but also their minds, the, the way they, they think about Jesus. Because there's this unmistakable link between the heart and the mind when it comes to salvation. That's what we see in passages like Romans 10, 9 and 10. Right? How can you believe in your heart? Right? That, that don't even make sense, right? Because the, the mind is where the, the, the believing and the thinking is, but, but Paul is saying here that there's a linkage here, right? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I've heard it been said before by people that there are many that will miss heaven by 18 inches. You have heard that before? So I guess that's the average distance between your head and your heart. We have all this information, and we have all this knowledge, and we have all the facts about Jesus, but they stay right here, and they never make it here. And that's the connection. That's what has to happen. That what we believe in our, in our minds never makes it to our hearts. And it's such a tragedy for that when this happens. That knowing facts about Jesus is not the same thing as having faith in Jesus. You know, some people are ready to go on a, a, a Bible edition of Jeopardy and can answer all types of questions about Jesus. No facts about Jesus. But they do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that's a huge, huge issue. That head knowledge about Jesus needs to become heart knowledge about Jesus before a person can be saved. That facts must become faith, right? Facts must become faith for us to be saved. So Paul was writing this letter to believers, right? The Philippian church, that's what this is a letter to. So he's not calling them to believe these facts about Jesus to be saved. What he's doing is that he's calling them to remember in whom they have believed for their salvation. This is the Jesus whom you believe. This is the Jesus in whom you've placed your faith in. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul wasn't just exhorting the Philippians to have the same mindset or the same attitude that Jesus had, though that is true. I believe he was also exhorting them to think about and grow in their knowledge and understanding of who their Lord and Savior actually was. And so that's how we'll be uh, dealing with this passage tonight. And verse 6 also uh, tells us, or begins by saying that Jesus was in the form of God. In the form of God. If you've had any conversations, and I'm not sure uh, if you have, uh, with Muslims, uh, what Muslims will do about Christians is they will say uh, that we worship multiple gods. If y'all know, did y'all know that? They will. That's, that's their accusation. See, they, they only, they say that they only worship one God. The one true God to them is Allah, one God. And so they say that we worship three gods. 
We worship, we worship the Jesus. We worship the, the uh, God the Father. And then we worship the Son of God, or, or the, the Spirit of God. And so, in fact, we only worship one God that, that, uh, uh, exists in three persons. Right? That's, that's how it works. We work, we worship a, 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 a Trinitarian God is the term that we use. And so we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so the question is always this, well, how does that work? How, how do you have three persons existing in one God? And I'll tell you what I tell everyone else. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a clue how it works. And anyone who says they do aren't being completely honest with you. It's a mystery. It's a mystery that people a lot smarter than me can't totally figure out either. But what we, what we do is we know this is what the Bible teaches and we believe the Bible and we take it by faith. We accept it for what it is. And that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. There has never been a time when Jesus did not exist, nor will there ever be a time when Jesus does, does not exist. There has never been a time when Jesus was not fully God, nor will there ever be a time when Jesus is not fully God. You see, even before Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary on that first Christmas morning, Jesus was, by His very nature, fully and eternally God. That baby was fully and eternally God. You say again, the question, how does that work? I don't know. I just know it's what the Bible teaches us. That's what we know what the Scriptures tell us. And so some people would say, well, even in the Bible, they say, well, show us, show us what God is like. If you want to know what God is like, what God the Father is like, all we must do is look to the Scriptures and look to the Son. Look to Jesus, and that's how we'll know what God is like. You see that they, we know that they, they both exist in the same form. That's what Paul's talking about here. This, this form means an outward manifestation of an inner reality. And so I would just want to encourage you if you're, having a hard time with this right now, you're in good company. This is a, this is a difficult thing for us to understand and to grasp. But if, if, if you're having a hard time, uh, you're in very good company. Philip was one of the 12 uh, uh, disciples and he didn't understand it very well either. We see this in John's Gospel. In John 14, 7-11, it says this, uh, when, when Jesus was, was speaking before uh, it was getting close to His time to depart, he says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? Do you do you not believe that I am in the father and the father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So Jesus is in the form of God. But not only did Jesus exist in the form of God, verse 6 also tells us that Jesus was equal with God. Equal with God. There's equality in the Godhead that each member of the Trinity is equal. That each one has the same power, has the same privilege, has the same position. All these things, they are absolutely equal in every way. That they all share in the same attributes and none is greater than the other. What we do see is a subordination in the Godhead. Right? There's a, a will, so, willful uh, subordination in the Godhead. You see that we see that that uh, God the Son submits Himself to God the Father, and we see that God the Spirit submits Himself to God the Son and God the Father. And even though we never see an example in the Scriptures of, of God the Father submitting Himself to the Son or the Spirit, that does not mean that they are not equal with the Father. Does that make sense? Because that's what we see. That's what we see throughout the Scriptures. That we see multiple examples of Jesus' equality with God. And all the miracles that he performed during his earthly ministry. Because what is a miracle? A miracle by definition is something that only God can do. That only God can perform. And, and that's all that Jesus did. That these multiple acts that we see throughout the, the Gospels. That Jesus commanded the storms to stop. And guess what they did? He said stop raining. Guess what it did? It stopped raining. He, said, he told the wind to stop blowing. And the wind stopped blowing. That Jesus commanded demons to come out of people. 
and they came out. Jesus even commanded dead people to stop being dead and they stopped being dead. Right? Who can do that? Only God can. Only someone who is equal with God can do that. And there is no situation, and there is no circumstance that we will ever face that is too big or too difficult for our Lord and Savior to deliver us from if it's within His will. Amen? Nothing too hard for Him. That Jesus Christ was, is, and always will be in the form of God and equal with God. To know the real Jesus, we must understand the divinity of Jesus. Secondly, to know the real Jesus, we must understand the humility of Jesus. Verses 7 and 8 says, But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and become obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I love this, this statement I found by A.W. Tozer uh, about these verses. It says, Christ refused to hold on to His divine rights and prerogatives. He veiled His deity, but He did not void His deity. Let me say it one more time. That is, that is too good, especially that second half. He veiled His deity, but He did not void His deity. You see, some of us have the wrong understanding of what humility is or what it means to be humble or meek. All those words are, are, are synonyms of one another. That humility does not mean weakness. Humility is power under control. And, 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 that, is, and that, is, that defines Jesus perfectly. You see, nobody makes the Son of God do anything that He doesn't want to do. Nobody bosses Jesus around. Nobody commands Jesus. Everything that He did, He did voluntarily and of His own accord. That Jesus' entire earthly ministry was marked by acts of humility. And one resource I used to prepare this week had this to say about Jesus and His humility. It says this, it says, He wasn't born in an influential city like Alexandria, Rome, Athens, or Jerusalem. He was born near a feeding trough in Bethlehem. He lived for 30 years in relative obscurity. Then, in His, his earthly ministry, He was known for loving unlovable people and humbly serving others. And at His death, He was nailed to a cross alongside two criminals. That's it. That's it. In, a, in a nutshell, that, that is the, the, the life of Jesus. Nothing but humility here. That verse 7 begins by telling us that Jesus made Himself of no reputation. Right? He wasn't trying to stand out. He wasn't all about look at me and cater to me and pamper to me and don't you know who I am? Serve me. He didn't do any of those things. He never used His divine nature to gain favor with anyone. He never demanded that anyone treat Him with dignity and respect that He was entitled to as the Son of God. You see, to the naked eye, there was nothing special about Jesus at all. He was average at best. Maybe even less than average if you look at what Isaiah 53 says about Him. He wouldn't stand out at all. You wouldn't give Him a second glance just at by face value. That He was nothing more than a carpenter's son from a nowhere town called Nazareth. Verse 7 goes on to tell us that Jesus also took on the form of a bondservant. Bondservant is just a nicer way to say slave. It's like the politically correct way of saying slave. I'm not a slave, I'm a bondservant. Does somebody else own you? Yes, then you're a slave. No, I'm a bondservant. You are a slave. It's the same word in the Greek. It's doulos. It's the same thing. And so that's how he, the form that he took. He took on the form of a slave or a bondservant. And a bondservant's whole life revolves around serving the wants and needs of other people. And, and, and what's ironic about His choice here is that Jesus was the only person in the history of the world and on the entire planet that truly warranted having others serve Him. He's the only one and yet He forfeited this. He for, for, uh, foregone this uh, right that He had and chose to serve others instead. Even the twelve Disciples that, that were following Him had a hard time with this aspect of Jesus. That they understood that He was the Lord and that His kingdom was coming. And they were excited about this. They were all excited about this kingdom because they didn't understand that this was going to be a heavenly kingdom. They thought it was going to be an earthly kingdom. And they were trying to position themselves where if, if Jesus is going to be the king, then He's going to need a, a cabinet. He's going to need some a right-hand man and a left-hand man. And 
and, and we, let's, let's get our positions where we want to be. We want to, you know, get a good spot in his, uh, in his, uh, leadership here. And so they're, they're arguing and, and trying to find a place jockeying. And then, uh, and Jesus comes along and, and, and kind of rocks their world. You see, Jesus wants to make sure they understand that everything in his kingdom is upside down from the way it is now. It's backwards. That everything that, the way it works here is going to be the opposite way in his kingdom. Listen to what he told them in Mark 10, 42 to 45. It says, but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. You see, it was even Jesus that took the role of the lowest servant possible in a first century household and washed the nasty feet of His disciples before the Last Supper. They was all, again, still arguing, debating, and, and He's the one that took it upon Himself to do this. One of them should have done it at least. He even washed Judas Iscariot's feet. Did y'all know that? He didn't skip Judas' feet. He washed his too. Even between the toes, I'm sure. Did a great job. Washed his feet knowing that he would later be his betrayer. And the last thing Paul tells us here in verse 7 is that Jesus also came in the likeness of men. I think what Paul is doing here is reminding what was happening in the early church. There were some false teachings that, that, uh, that, that Jesus claimed that he that, that wasn't really a man, that he was a, a phantom. He didn't have a, a tangible body. He wasn't a, a physical body. It was like a, a manifestation is all that he was. That he only appeared to be a man. But that's simply not true. That Jesus was, was really just like you and me in every way, except one very critical way. He was without sin. That's what separated him. Oh, and besides him being God, that's also pretty big as well. We see this in, in Hebrews 4.15. It says, For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. And Paul wanted to make sure that the Philippians knew that Jesus was fully human, that He needed to eat, He needed to drink, He needed to rest, He needed to sleep, and He needed to use doors too until after His resurrection. After his resurrection, he just showed up and says, peace be with you. And just there he was. And he walked through walls or whatever. But before then, in his full human, human state, he had to use doors just like everyone else. And you might be asking yourself, but I thought, Brother Mike, you just said earlier that Jesus was fully God. So isn't he fully God too? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He is fully God and fully human. All at the same time. Not not half and half, not 50-50, 100% God, 100% man, all at one time. We said that don't make sense. I know it don't. But that's what the Word of God tells us. You say, well, how does that work? I don't, I don't understand it. And what we should do with this, this question is, is what we do with the same questions about the Trinity. We file it away and just accept it by faith. I said, I don't know how this works. I don't understand how it works. But this is what the Word of God teaches us. Verse 8, Paul doubled down on the humanity of Jesus by emphasizing His ultimate act of humility. His death on the cross. His death on the cross. See, six weeks from today, we will be celebrating not only the death of Jesus on the cross, but also His resurrection from the dead. Easter's coming. Y'all know that? I think I'm right. I think it's six weeks. I think I counted it up right. But it's coming. It's coming. In case you were unaware... That's what Christians are celebrating at Easter time. We're celebrating the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we celebrate. The world celebrates bunnies that lay painted eggs like a chicken. That's what they're celebrating, right? And the world thinks that we're the ones, the, the weirdos with strange beliefs, right? <laughs> they need to look at themselves in the mirror. You see, we know that the Bible tells us that Jesus was born as, sin, as a sinless baby so that He could die as a sinless man to atone for the sins of the world. Jesus was born as a sinless baby so that He could die as a sinless man to atone for the sins 
of the world. As 1 Peter 2.24 tells us that Jesus bore our sins in His own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might, have, might live for righteousness. Just think of it this way. and It might be a simple way of thinking about it, but Jesus was born to die. What was His purpose? To die. That was it. That was the whole purpose for His existence. He was born to die and die on a cross. That was His destiny. It was prophesied over 700 years prior to His death. Isaiah 53 is almost a play-by-play of the passion of the Christ. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 12. It says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's the one that always jumped out at me. It was God's will for this to happen. You see that verse 10? Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Who does that sound like? That sounds like Jesus to me. Sounds like the real Jesus. Right? The Jesus of the Scriptures. I love the way that Pastor Tony Marita described the, the, the purpose of Christ's death. He says, In this most degrading of all deaths, we find the hope of salvation. In the most degrading of deaths, of all types of deaths, of any possible way someone could lose their life, we find the hope of salvation. That 1 Corinthians one twenty one tells us that God made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that what we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. See, Jesus is fully God. He is fully God and He's fully man. That Jesus was fully dead but now He is fully alive. That we were fully condemned in our sins and without hope but by placing our faith in the person and work of Christ we are fully forgiven of our sins and we are fully reconciled back to God. And that makes me fully joyful. If that even makes sense. Those words don't really go together, but oh well. Fully joyful because of these truths. All because Jesus humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, so that we might be saved. Amen? To know the real Jesus, we must understand the humility of Jesus. And lastly, to know the real Jesus, we must understand the sovereignty of Jesus. The sovereignty of Jesus. The word sovereignty is not one we use a whole lot. We're not really familiar with it. Sovereignty means to have absolute and supreme authority. Absolute and supreme authority. You see, we live in what is known as a democratic republic. Did y'all know that? That's it. That's, that's, that's the form of government that we use, a democratic republic. At least we do for now. <laughs> for, for right now in, in 2020, up to this point, we'll find out what happens in November, but this is what we have for now. And, and so we really don't understand what it means to live under the sovereign rule of a king or a monarch or a dictator for that matter. At least not for now. Right? At least not for now. We don't know what that's like. That we have a president that serves at the pleasure of the people. 
that the president is the leader of our nation, but he is not the ruler of our nation. Does that make you understand the difference between the two? He's the leader of our nation, but he's not the ruler of our nation. If enough people don't like the president or disagree with his policies, they can vote him out of office every four years. Think of it like a, a civilized way of overthrowing the presidency. The election process, that's what we have here. And sadly, many Christians think that they can treat King Jesus the same way. The same exact way. If, well, I don't like this, or I don't like that, and I'm not going to listen to you on that, or I, I will submit myself in this area because I agree, and I'm not going to submit in this area because I don't agree. It don't work like that. Sovereignty is absolute. If Jesus is Lord, He's Lord of everything. He's Lord of all. What He says goes. He's not asking for your opinion on anything. Right? He gives commands. He don't take commands. In verse 9, we see that Jesus is, is to be highly exalted. Right? That God says, Therefore God also has highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name. Therefore, right? There's that word, therefore. Because of everything that Paul has just listed in verses 5-8, through eight, God the Father gave Jesus the name which is above every name. So the question is, and I didn't really think about this before until I started studying for this passage, I've always just assumed that the name that was above every name was the name of Jesus. And y'all probably heard that same thing, but studying this, that, that can't be so because he already has the name of Jesus. Right? He's already named Jesus. So, so what exactly is the name that is above every name? And we think about, we think about Jesus being a name above every name. I could, we can say maybe that's partially true. That Mary and Joseph had already named him Jesus at his birth, but verse nine is talking about giving Jesus a new exalted name. Y'all see that? It's something new. It's it's not the same. A new exalted name, or or better yet, think of it as a title. That Lord is the name that is above every name, right? Yahweh, right? The the name that we know from the Old Testament, the personal name for God. That Lord is the name that signifies the absolute and supreme authority of Jesus Christ. The pastor John Piper explains it this way. He, he, he could do a better job of explaining than I can, so I'm just going to use what he says. He says, What name did Jesus receive after his resurrection that he did not have before? Not Jesus. Jesus is precisely the name of the humble servant who went to Calvary. It was his lordship and messian, messi, messiahship, his messiah, his messianic lordship that was bestowed on him at his exaltation. Not that he wasn't Messiah and Lord before his resurrection. He was. But he had not fulfilled the mission of Messiah until he had died for our sin and risen again. And therefore, before his death and resurrection, the Lordship of Christ over the world had not been brought to full actuality. The rebel forces were yet undefeated and the power of darkness held the world in its grip. In order to be acclaimed Messiah and Lord, the Son of God had to come, defeat the enemy, and lead his people out of bondage and triumph over sin and Satan and death. Does that make sense? I know it's, I know it's a lot, but that's, that, that, I think that's a right explanation of why this name is Lord. That's this new name, this exalted name is Lord. The fact that Jesus is Lord makes it insane that we think that we can tell, uh, you know, tell him what to do. Right? That, or we can tell him no. If, it, if everything his word says and, and we say, I'm not going to do that. We, we are rejecting His Lordship. You don't tell the Lord no. It doesn't make any sense. His disciples had the same disconnect. In Luke 6.46, He said this. Jesus said to them, they were disagreeing with Him. We're not doing what He said. He says, Why do you call Me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Right? It doesn't make any sense. How, how, you're, you're saying I'm your Lord, but yet you're not doing what I tell you to do. That doesn't work. It doesn't either... You don't understand what, what lordship means or something is wrong here. This, this doesn't make any sense. See, Jesus as our exalted Lord means that He reigns and rules over everyone and everything. He reigns and rules over everyone and everything. All of us in this room, everyone outside of this room, whether they believe or trust in Him or not, He rules and reigns over everyone and everything single thing that his lordship is universal and everyone will give an account to him one day everyone will answer to him 
In verses 10 and 11, we see that Jesus is to be worshipped. He's to be worshipped. It says that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth and that every, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, throughout the Bible, bowing the knee is seen as a posture of reverence and respect, but here it's used as a posture of worship. Right? Whenever that, that rare occasion, whenever we have a invitation time or an altar call, I invite you to come down here and make an altar of this front of the auditorium. I invite you to, to take a knee, right? To bow your knee, to humble yourself before God. That's what we do. It's a, it's a posture of reverence. It's a posture of worship before God. In Revelation 1, we, when, when the Apostle John saw the exalted Lord, he bypassed the bowing of the knee and went full prostrate like he was a dead man. Right? He just totally skipped that kneeling down part and just fell on his face. You see, worship is the right an appropriate response from the people that have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. That Paul makes it clear that one day every knee will bow to the Lord. Now we have the choice to bow our knees. One day that choice will be made for us. Right now you can choose to bow the knee. One day you will be made to bow the knee. You see, I think Paul is talking about here at the end, the end of days, the days of judgment. It says those in heaven will bow their knees and worship. These are the holy angels and the redeemed that are awaiting glorification. And then those on the earth will bow their knees also in worship. These are the, the people that are alive when Christ returns, both the lost and the saved. And those are, that are under the earth will bow their knees also in worship. These are the fallen angels and the redeemed, unredeemed dead that are awaiting final judgment and eternal punishment for their sins. You see, every person that places their faith in Jesus will be saying Amen at this time. They will be saying Amen that the Lord has come. And every person that rejects Jesus will be saying, Oh no. Oh no, what have I done? What have I done? There will be a day of rejoicing for one group of people. It will be a, great, a day of great terror for everyone else. That every saved tongue will be confessing that Jesus is Lord all the way to heaven. And every condemned tongue will be confessing that Jesus is Lord all the way to hell. That Warren Wiersbe stated it this way. He says, to bow before the Lord now means salvation. To bow before the Lord at judgment means condemnation. You see, to know the real Jesus, we must understand and submit ourselves to the sovereignty of Jesus. So I only got one main question as we close tonight. Do you know this Jesus? Do you know this Jesus? Because this is the real Jesus. This isn't some made up Jesus. This isn't some counterfeit Jesus. This isn't a Jesus that we decide or we say, I like this type of Jesus. And this is the real deal. This is the real Jesus. And it's important because this is the real Jesus and only the real Jesus can save sinners. This is the Jesus that you must place your faith in to be reconciled back to God. There is no other name given amongst men in which we must be saved. This Jesus is whom we're talking about tonight. Do we understand that the divinity of Jesus, that Jesus is the pre-existent, co-eternal Son of God, there never has been a moment in time when Jesus wasn't fully God and there never will be. Do we understand the humility of Jesus, that Jesus laid aside His privileges as the Son of God to suffer and die on the cross for our sins, your sins, my sins, and the sins of everyone that would ever believe. Do we understand the sovereignty of Jesus? That Jesus alone is the exalted Lord and worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. That we worship Him. You see, our mission is to tell the world about this Jesus. That's why we exist as a church. That's what, that's what we've been called. That, that is the great commission to tell people about this Jesus and His Gospel. Let us adore this Jesus. Let our minds be on this Jesus. Let our attitudes be like this Jesus. Let our actions reflect this Jesus. All of this is to be for His glory and for God the Father. Amen? Is this your Jesus? If not, He can be tonight. He can be tonight. 
See, the Bible tells us whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that we're all condemned because of our sins. There's no way for us to be reconciled back to God on our own. We can't do enough good deeds. We can't give enough money to the church. We can't put enough hours in uh, at the food bank or the homeless shelter or any of those things to fix what's broken inside of us. Only Jesus can do that. Only He can forgive sins. That we must place our faith in Him. Not just in Him, but His work on the cross for us. That's what it means to place your faith in Jesus. So if you have not done that, I invite you to do it tonight. You don't have to do it with me. I, I, you don't have to come down here and tell me. You can do it right there where you're at. You can be saved right there in your seat. But what you must do is you must come and profess it publicly and let everyone know what you've done. So we can rejoice with you, but also uh, get you connected with discipleship and help you start growing in your faith. And so if you feel like that's what the Lord is leading you to do tonight, I invite you to do that. But well, whatever it is that the Lord has laid on your heart through a message like this, I don't know what that might be. Some of you might just need to come pray and ask God to forgive you for having the wrong view. Now, that you're one of those people that have kind of made your own customized Jesus. And it's not this Jesus, but you're following some other Jesus. And maybe you need to do some work with Him and just say, I'm sorry, forgive me for not following the real Jesus. But whatever you would have, God would have you to do tonight before you go. Let's do business with Him before we depart. Amen? Let me pray for us and we'll have time to respond. Father, we thank you so much for the, the power and the clarity of your word. We thank you for this ancient hymn, this, this ancient creed that is so rich with theology of, of who Jesus is. Father, we ask that you would help us to understand everything that we've heard tonight. That it would not just remain in our heads as facts, but it would transition to our hearts as objects of faith. That these words would, would strengthen us, would encourage us, would embolden us, would compel us to go out into our community, to go into our workplaces, to, to go back to our homes, to our families, to our friends, and tell them about this Jesus, that they might be saved also. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our church and what you're doing in our community. And we look forward to what you will do in the days to come. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.